so I am very glad to welcome Ted today in Paris. As I said in my uh, lecture, uh, we met, I think, for the first time or in the 1970s at the time when I came as a postdoc uh, to visit uh, uh, Art Shallow's uh, group in, in Stanford, and you had just arrived one year earlier, I think, as an assistant professor, and you were working in, in, in Ted's group. And as I said, it was a very exciting time. It was a time when we really got the first tunable lasers and were learning how to use them for spectroscopy and for manipulating atoms. And uh, I was amazed at uh, the, inventi the ingeniosity with which you were able uh, almost every week to find a new way to use these lasers. You had an unfair advantage, the fact that you are in Stanford, you were getting the first prototypes of the lasers at spectral, uh, uh, that uh, coherent radiation and uh, spectrophysics were delivering, but you were, you, you were finding ways to use them every week and doing fantastic experiments in higher resolution laser spectroscopy and also uh, getting uh, new ideas to manipulate atoms with light. With Art Shallow, you had this seminal paper about uh, cooling of atoms, uh, Doppler cooling of atoms using laser light. And uh, from that time on, you were really in love with the hydrogen atom. And I guess you will talk to us about 40 year story between you and the hydrogen atom. You have this point in common with Dan. I, w I met Dan a few weeks ago in South America, and all his students tell that he considers the hydrogen atom is the most important thing, thing in physics. So you have approached the hydrogen atom in different ways, and uh, you will tell us about your experiments, the experiments by which you were able to improve the precision of the readback constants and lamp shift measurement by many orders of magnitude and also how this led you to the discovery invention of the frequency combs which have revolutionized the measurement of time. So um, I must say that I'm very glad that we have had this friendship for such a long time and I'm very happy that you accepted to come to Paris today and we are going to listen to your talk about hydrogen. Thank you, Serge, for giving me the opportunity to come here to tell you something about my passion for hydrogen. The hydrogen atom, of course, has been studied for more than a century, but it still holds opportunities and challenges, and I want to tell you uh, about it from, from my point of view. Uh, the simple Balmer spectrum of hydrogen has been the Rosetta Stone 100 years ago for deciphering the strange rules of quantum physics. Hydrogen is, of course, the simplest of the atoms. And uh, the Swiss school teacher Balmer was the first to recognize that there is a simple formula that describes the wavelengths of these Balmer lines. This formula was generalized by Rydberg. We heard about Rydberg states. And there is this at first empirical Rydberg constant that first shows up here. Then came Bohr with his radical planetary atom model with quantum hypothesis, which had many flaws. But he was able to express the Rydberg constant in terms of other constants, in terms of the electron mass, electron charge, Planck's constant, speed of light. And so that indicated to people there must be something to this strange quantum nature. Uh, Sommerfeld knew, as Steve Bohr, that the hydrogen Balmer lines are not single lines, they have a fine structure. He tried to explain the fine structure by generalizing the planetary model to include elliptical orbits and relativistic effects. And in this context, he introduced the electromagnetic fine structure constant alpha. De Broglie was inspired by the hydrogen spectrum to come up with, with the concept of meta waves, which was then cast into a wave equation by Schrodinger. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so this is a very highly successful theory. We still are debating what is it that the Schrodinger wave function describes. Is it reality or is it belief, belief of a physicist? Dirac was able to generalize 
the Schrodinger equation to include relativistic effects. And not only relativistic effects, this equation was so beautiful that it also included the spin of the electron and even the existence of anti-electrons of positrons. And people felt this must now be the ultimate truth in quantum science until Willis Lamb confirmed what had been suspected before, that Dirac was not really right, that there are two levels in the hydrogen atoms, the 2s and the neighboring 2p state, that, are, that don't have precisely the same energy, but they are about 1,000 megahertz apart. Beta was the first to give an intuitive explanation in terms of vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. Uh, that these fluctuations make the electron jitter around, so that's from the point of view of the electron, the nucleus appears smeared out. And so in an S state where the electron actually comes close to the nucleus, it's less tightly bound than in the P state where it avoids the nucleus. There's another effect of the opposite sign, uh, that is that there are virtual electron-positron pairs that you can polarize, so the, the vacuum behaves like a dielectric. This was the beginning of what culminated in the theory of quantum electrodynamics, a prototype of quantum field theories, and in 65 the Nobel Prize in physics was given to Tomonaga, Schwinger, and Feynman for this edifice. That was all before my time, but uh, I feel fortunate that I started to study physics just after the laser had been invented. In 60, Ted Maiman demonstrated the first ruby laser. The race to build the first laser was triggered by a seminal paper by Schorlo and Towns. And uh, this has really led to a revolution in all areas of science and technology. And the impact on science can perhaps be judged by looking at the Nobel Prizes. The first prize was given to Towns, together with his Russian colleagues, Basso von Prokhorov, for the invention of the maser and laser. But then there were prizes for holography, Gabor, laser spectroscopy, Bloomberg and Scholo, laser cooling, Chu, Claude Cohen Danucci, Bill Phillips, femtochemistry, Semiconductor lasers, uh, Alfred Hoffman Kromer, uh, Bose Einstein condensation, uh, Cornell, Ketterle, and Wyman, then quantum optics, Roy Glauber, and precision spectroscopy, including the frequency comb techniques for Chen Hall and myself, uh, fiber optics, Kao, and most recently, the prize to Serge Roche and Dave Weinland, and also, uh, of course, takes strong advantage of. The laser, the manipulation, manipulation of individual photons and atoms. So, uh, since uh, I was at Stanford in the early 70s with Art Scholow, and uh, we were the first to have a monochromatic but widely tunable dye lasers, it was clear that hydrogen would be an intriguing testing ground for the newfangled spectroscopy that became possible with lasers. And so more than 40 years ago, I published an article on Doppler-free saturation spectroscopy of the red Balmer alpha line of hydrogen. And so where previously spectroscopy so an unresolved blend of Doppler broadened lines, we could see individual fine structure components. In particular, we were very proud that we could see the famous lamp shift directly resolved in the optical spectrum. This was the beginning of a long adventure that continues today that has advanced the fractional frequency uncertainty in spectroscopy of hydrogen from something like seven decimal digits before lasers to 15 decimal digits today. And I'm fairly confident that we can continue along this path. In order to get such extreme precision, of course, one likes to have very sharp resonances. And there is a very sharp two-photon resonance in hydrogen from the ground state to the metastable 2S state. 
that you can excite with ultraviolet light at 243 nanometers. And if you use two counter-propagating beams, you can eliminate first-order Doppler broadening without any need to cool the atoms. The setup uh, that we have been using starting in the early or in the late 80s is a hydrogen atomic beam apparatus. Hydrogen atoms are very difficult to laser cool, so we so far cool hydrogen atoms by letting them collide with a copper nozzle mounted at the bottom of a helium cryostat in a vacuum chamber. The two counterpropagating ultraviolet beams are uh, produced in a standing wave field inside a build-up cavity. The atoms can be excited while they travel along the standing wave. And if they are in the metastable 2S state, we can force them to emit Lyman alpha photons by applying a quenching electric field. And the typical resonance is shown here. The natural line width should be as narrow as one hertz. Experimentally, we are not there yet. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the atoms are not standing still. We have time of light broadening. But nonetheless, uh, one can get a line width of a few hundred hertz. And uh, if one would stretch the visible boundless spec spectrum that we had looked at in the beginning, uh, so that it would fit on the same scale, we could wrap it around the equator, not only once, but about 20,000 times. So with such a sharp resonance, the question is, how do you measure it? How do you measure the wavelengths or the frequency of light? And wavelength measurements run out of steam at about 10, 11 digits because of unavoidable wavefront errors. And Art Scholler had good advice. If you want to measure anything very precisely, try to measure it as a frequency. Try to count the number of cycles per second because counting is intrinsically a digital procedure that is immune to many kinds of noise. So we followed Art Schauler's advice, but it took about a decade of hard work, and we had to take advantage of big harmonic laser frequency chains that had been built at a handful of uh, national metrology laboratories. But in the end of the 90s, we indeed did have a measurement of this frequency of the sharp one as 2 s resonance, which at the time was the most accurate measurement of ultraviolet or visible opt optical frequency. And from this frequency and from the frequency of other transitions in hydrogen that had been measured here in Paris, in the group of François Birabin and Lucille Gillian, uh, we were able to extract the Rydberg constant and also the lamp shift of the ground state. Uh, which at the time was the mo most accurate test of quantum electrodynamics for an atom. And if you believe in quantum electrodynamic theory, you can derive from the comparison of different hydrogen lines the root mean square charge radius of the proton, and also from similar experiments in deuterium, the so-called structure radius of the deuteron. And uh, both of these are the most accurate values more accurate than those that can be obtained by electron scattering experiments at uh, nuclear accelerators. So that was the status at the end of the 90s. And then a lot of magazines and newspapers reported about a breakthrough that frequency chains are no longer needed, that now it has become easy to count the ripples of a light wave to measure the precise frequency of a laser. And, uh, of course, this frequency comb was highlighted in the 2005 Nobel Prize to Jen Hall and myself. So we came up with a simple tool for solving what was difficult or impossible before. We have now a phase coherent link between the optical region and the radio frequency region. And such combs can serve as clockwork mechanisms for optical atomic clocks. And I understand that next week Dave Weinland will tell you about single atom optical shocks. The laser frequency comb, in principle, is exceedingly simple, but exceedingly difficult to explain to journalists, to lay people, and even to particle physicists. So uh, here is my attempt to illustrate what is a frequency comb. 
at the heart of it is a femtosecond laser, a short pulse laser. In its most elementary form, you have a cavity consisting of two mirrors, and there is a short flash of light, a femtosecond pulse, bouncing back and forth. So in this respect, it resembles the Gedanken light clock of Einstein to illustrate the special theory of relativity, except we are talking about a laser, so there is some amplifying medium, and you can keep it going even though you couple out a train of pulses. Such lasers were in use in hundreds of laboratories at the time of this invention of the frequency comb, and they were mostly used really as sources of extremely short light pulses to study ultra-fast phenomena, to study relaxation phenomena in semiconductors, uh, uh, femtochemistry, things like that. So why do we call it a frequency comb? The people who did precision spectroscopy typically used a different kind of laser. They used a single mode laser, a single frequency laser. It also has a cavity, but you make sure that only a single mode of the cavity is excited, uh, characterized by an integer number of half wavelengths fitting between the two mirrors. And so what comes out is a sinusoidal traveling wave of just a single frequency. Uh, in practice, it's often not so simple to make a single mode laser. More likely than not, the laser will want to oscillate, say, in two modes. So now you have two standing waves inside, two traveling waves coming out, and of course they are superimposed. So if you look at the interference between them, this kind of laser would emit a train of elongated wave packets, and the energy inside is sloshing back and forth. If you have three modes, uh, it starts to look like a pulsed laser, and just five modes are enough to make a laser that emits short pulses of light, that's when all the modes oscillate in phase, separated by an amazingly long period of dark. The modes are on even in the dark period, but they cancel each other through mutual interference. And for the laser to operate in this nice stable mode, there has to be some non-linear coupling mechanism that ensures that all the modes play in this orchestra. So it's a way of non-linear self-organization that guarantees that the spacing of two lines of this frequency comb is very precisely equal to the number of pulses per second emitted. And so it's a simple scheme, but what has surprised most experts is how far these principles could be pushed. That you could take a Modlock titanium sapphire laser that emits femtosecond pulses in the deep red, you could focus this light into a special microstructured silica fiber with a few micron size quartz core surrounded by airfield holes. There the intensity is large enough that the index of refraction is changed and you broaden the spectrum by self phase modulation and other nonlinear effects. You can, in the end, produce flashes of white light, white light that can be dispersed into a rainbow of colors. But what is remarkable is that this process of white light continuum generation can be so reproducible that you still get comb lines. So now you have a rainbow of colors, but if you look closely, you find it's 100,000 or a million sharp comb lines spaced by very precisely the repetition frequency of this laser. In principle, you don't know before where these comb lines are. You would know if all the pulses were identical replicas. Then the comb lines would just be the uh, precise integer harmonics of the re repetition frequency, as you can describe by a Fourier series. But because there can be a slippage of the phase of the carrier wave relative to the envelope, there is some global shift by some unknown amount. Except if you have a comb that spans more than an octave, then it's easy to actually measure this shift. You just take comb lines from the red end, send them through a nonlinear doubling crystal, so you produce new comb lines in the blue, shifted by twice this amount, 
And if you look at the collective beat node, new comb lines versus original comb lines, you get a radio frequency signal that reveals this carrier envelope offset frequency. And if you can measure it, you can take it into account, or you can use servo controls to make it go away. And then, if you make it go away, if we have a laser that indeed emits pulses of identical waveform, now, if we measure the repetition frequency with the atomic clock, the cesium atomic clock, we know that we have a comb of calibration lines uh, with frequencies that are precise integer multiples of this primary reference of frequency. And if you want to build an optical atomic clock, you can use server controls to lock one of the comb lines to some sharp atomic or ion resonance, and then you know that the repetition frequency is a very precise integer fraction of this sharp optical resonance. And because the optical frequency is 100,000 times faster than the microwave frequency of a cesium clock, there is the potential to make optical clocks that eventually might reach uncertainties of 10 to the minus 20 or something like this. Uh, most combs in use today are based on fiber optical technology as developed for telecommunications. You can buy such combs commercially. Uh, how to use them to measure the frequency of hydrogen? There was a poster printed in 2005 on the occasion of the Nobel Prize that illustrates how you do that. So you have a tunable laser, highly monochromatic of course. You send this light to see if hydrogen atoms are excited. If you hit the resonance, if hydrogen atoms are excited, you can find out what is the frequency by sending part of it to the frequency comb and by looking at the radio frequency beat node between this laser and the nearest comb line. In reality, it looks slightly more complicated. This is a snapshot of our hydrogen laboratory with uh, Nikolai Kolachevsky and Mike Fischer. That was at the time when we still used dye lasers, so the laser setup is in the back. Nowadays, we use all solid state lasers. It looks much more uh, cleared up. There is the hydrogen atomic beam apparatus in the foreground. As a reference, of course, uh, we still need a cesium clock. And we were fortunate that we got the Paris transportable cesium fountain clock developed at the Observatoire for two such, or if, even for three such measurements in Garching. Here is Michel Abgral adjusting some diode laser for laser cooling of cesium atoms that are thrown up and fall down inside this magnetic shield through a microwave cavity. Here is our hydrogen 1S, 2S team. Christian Patai, who graduated last December, uh, Arthur Medveyev, Nikolai Kolachevsky, Yanis Alnis, they uh, improved the frequency measurements and uh, in 2011, uh, published a, a new number with a relative uncertainty of 4.2 times 10 to the minus 15. So an uncertainty of only plus minus 10 hertz at the Lyman alpha frequency. Uh, this was the latest of our frequency comb measurements of the hydrogen resonance. The very first measurement in 1999 is illustrated here. Each data point gives the result of one day of data taking with statistical errors. And we had day-to-day -day fluctuations, but we, they were not out of line with the statistical uncertainty. But things were more serious in 2003, when we got considerably smaller day-to-day -day errors, uh, considerably smaller single-day errors, but still big fluctuations. So that indicated that there is some uncontrolled systematic error. And I was very relieved when in 2010, with a very much improved laser system now, with a solid state laser of subhertz line width, these day to day fluctuations had been considerably reduced. There is another measurement that has just been submitted for publication, uh, taken in the same year with even smaller day to day fluctuations. Uh, the systematic error is still large because we used a detector that was not well characterized at the time. But so there is progress. 
this very latest measurement relied not on the transportable cesium clock, but on a stationary cesium clock at the German Physikalisch-Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig, uh, which was linked through 920 kilometers of optical fiber. Uh, this is Katharine Predel, who is now in Paris at the Observatoire that was part of her thesis work. In order to get any light through such a long length of fiber, you need amplifiers. And uh, she personally installed nine amplifiers in nine huts along the line, so the two bidirectional fiber links, each with nine amplifiers that link the PTB and our laboratory. At, at each side, there is a frequency comb that is used to uh, produce the reference frequency for distributed feedback fiber laser at the telecommunications wavelengths that can be sent through this link. Uh, you need active fiber stabilization to compensate for drift seismic effects. And uh, we were all pleasantly surprised by the performance of this fiber link. If you look at the so-called Allen deviation, the fractional instability versus integration time, uh, we find that the standard Allen deviation quickly gets smaller than the typical performance of, an, of a single iron optical clock. If you use the so-called modified Allen deviation that allows you to distinguish between white phase noise and flicker phase noise, uh, it uh, goes down even faster. And after just 20 minutes or so of integration time, you, you are in 10 to the minus 19 territory. Very recently, uh, people have used this uh, double fiber link in a loop to have an effective distance of 1,840 kilometers, and it still shows similar performance. So that's boding well for plans to have a Europe-wide network of fiber links to link uh, metrology labs and other laboratories who would like to take advantage of very precise time, timing and frequencies. Yeah, for the hydrogen spectroscopy, uh, we made more progress after this latest measurement. Arthur Matveev installed a new detector which uh, replaces the photomultiplier to look for the Lyman alpha photons. Essentially, it's a graphite co coated metal cylinder that allows you a four pi solid angle of detection. And uh, so the statistical uncertainty very quickly is much reduced, and I think we can hope to do better in the future, in particular if in Braunschweig there is a very precise optical clock as a reference. So what do you do uh, if you can uh, measure the frequency of hydrogen so well? One possibility indeed would be to use hydrogen as a primary standard of time and frequency. You could redefine the second in terms of hydrogen. This will probably not happen, but I think it's a possibility. One can, in comparing hydrogen and other optical atomic clocks, ask the question how constant are fundamental constants. We can expect as CERN reopens after the scheduled downtime uh, uh, that it will become possible to do very high res resolution spectroscopy of trapped anti-hydrogen, and then of course uh, there is the interesting question, are uh, matter and antimatter precisely the same or are there detectable differences? Uh, there is one aspect where it doesn't really help to measure more precisely, and that is if you want to measure the Rydberg constant. This is the CoData 2010 official value of the Rydberg constant. And it has an uncertainty of 5 times 10 to the minus 12, so much less well known than the hydrogen frequency. The reason is that in order to extract the Rydberg constant, we need to know not just the hydrogen frequency, but also the correction due to the finite size of the proton. And this 
root mean square proton charge radius limits how well we can determine this constant. If you look at the uncertainty budget for in the theory of energy levels of hydrogen, we see that uh, the uncertainty due to the proton size is by far the largest of any uncertainty. And uh, so this question of how large or how small is a proton is very important if we want to make progress. Uh, there has been spectroscopy of hydrogen uh, that was actually able to give values of the proton size. In particular here in Paris, the group of Francois Birabin, Lucille Julien and co-workers, they for years looked at transitions from the 2S state up to high-lying Rydberg states to S and D Rydberg states. And from the comparison of that with the 1S2 frequency, one can derive the lamp shift of the ground state. And uh, this should be the theoretical value if there wasn't a proton size effect. And so from the discrepancy between theory and experiment, one can derive how big is the proton. There is another experiment also pursued here in Paris uh, to look not at the high-lying Rydberg states that are so easily perturbed by electric field, but to look at the 1S, 3S transition in two-photon spectroscopy. The difficulty here is that you need laser light at an awkward wavelength of 205 nanometers, and uh, this is difficult to produce with a continuous wave laser. In our group in Garching, we are currently exciting this transition not with, with a continuous wave laser, but with picosecond pulses from a mode locked laser. So we do direct frequency comb excitation of such a two photon resonance, where all these pairs of comb lines satisfy the resonance condition so that uh, the excitation probability can be the same as you would get with a resonantly tuned CW laser. But the advantage of using these intense picosecond pulses is that it's much easier to drive nonlinear processes so we can produce 205 nanometer radiation in two stages of cavity enhanced second harmonic generation uh, with powers of about 10 milliwatts or so. So here is our 1S3S team, Dylan Yost, a postdoc from uh, Boulder, and Elizabeth Peters. And so they have set up an experiment where you have a vacuum apparatus, a hydrogen atomic beam. There is also a build-up cavity, but only with a factor of 10 enhancement for these short pulses. And where the pulses meet here in, at the nozzle, uh, you have a Doppler-free two-photon excitation. And the signal right now is detected by looking at Balma alpha photons with an optical fiber in close proximity and an avalanche photodiode. Uh, the, the laser comb is broad enough that you excite not only 2S3S but also 2S3D. And if you look at all the fine structure and uh, hyperfine structure intervals, we, have, we expect eight lines. Uh, and of course, each line is repeated with a modulo, the free spectral range of the comb. So it takes a little detective work to identify the lines. But here is a signal as they are right now producing. And so this is the 1S, 3S resonance. You can fit it to some analytic line shape. And the statistical uncertainty should be, or is fairly small, I think about 30 kilohertz. So if systematic effects, such as field shifts or so, are brought under control, I think this will be a, a good way to get an independent measurement of this resonance. But the interest in, in new spectroscopic measurements of the proton size, of course, have been triggered since uh, an international collaboration succeeded in the summer of 2009 to measure the lamp shift in exotic muonic hydrogen. And from this muonic hydrogen, where the electron is replaced by a 200 times heavier muon, which comes much closer to the nucleus, one can derive a very precise value of the proton radius. So it's an 
international collaboration that has grown to more than 30 people, Randolph Pohl and Franz Gottman are the spokespeople, and of course with strong uh, participation from the Laboratoire Castle Brussel here in Paris. Uh, the experiments are performed at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland because there they have a very intense source of highly energetic protons, the so-called proton ring cyclotron. These protons are slammed into a graphite target where you produce pions, these pions decay after a short time, into muons. The, the, the muons also decay, but they live for about two microseconds, and that's long enough to capture them in hydrogen and to perform spectroscopy of these muonic hydrogen atoms. So uh, the muonic hydrogen atom is similar to the ordinary hydrogen atom, except everything is scaled by the muon mass, so the energy levels are 200 times farther apart. Uh, the capture will populate some Rydberg states, and about 1% of these atoms decay into the metastable 2S state. Uh, there is a lamp shift in this muonic hydrogen. The 2P state, un uh, different from hydrogen, is now less tightly bound. That is because the lamp shift here is dominated by the effect of vacuum polarization rather than vacuum fluctuations. The fluctuations cannot do much to this heavy muon. So in principle, the theory is even simpler than for ordinary hydrogen. And so the experiment is sketched here. You produce mu muons by pion decay, capture them in a cyclotron trap, let them lose energy by passing through a metallized plastic foil. When they're slow enough, you apply a high voltage pulse and you guide the muons through this array of solenoids to separate them from background particles into the target chamber inside another superconducting solenoid where you have hydrogen atoms, where you have hydrogen molecules at about 10 tor or so, and the pressure is chosen so that there's a good probability to capture the muons in the middle. And to see the lamp shift, you need intense pulses at a wavelength of six microns. This is produced by some diode pump disk lasers as pump sources of a titanium sapphire amplifier seeded by a continuous wave laser. Much of this laser work really has been, at least the, the seed laser has been carried out here in Paris. And then you shift in three steps of stimulated Raman scattering into the six micron region. The light is sent into some kind of multi-pass cavity to bounce back and forth and have a good chance to excite the muonic atoms. When a muon enters, and there's only one at a time, uh, you get a trigger signal uh, by passing this muon through a stack of thin carbon foils. The electron can be detected with a scintillation detector, and then you have a few hundred nanoseconds time to, uh, to trigger the laser to have a chance to capture the atom. So the laser engineering took some uh, effort. And here is, uh, when, when the experiment worked, here is an animation that I made up because I was so excited about it, which shows the original cyclotron trap here. Here, here comes the pion. Uh, and now there is a muon captured, and this muon is slowed down by passing through this plastic foil, this metallized plastic foil. When it's slow enough, a high voltage pulse sends it on its way. So, travels around this bend. Here is the target chamber. So this is this multi-pass cavity, the hydrogen gas. Here comes the muon, the trigger signal. There's another trigger signal from a second stack. And now it's stopped, forms an atom, and then the laser flashes. And if you're lucky, you get a signal on an avalanche photodiode. 
In practice, uh, during the experiment, the laser flashes several hundred times per second, but uh, on resonance, you get at most something like five or six good events per hour. That has to do with the needed discrimination against background, but uh, uh, it was a challenge because initially there was no resonance in the expected range. This is the signal versus frequency. And if you believe in the proton radius from electron scattering experiments, the signal was expected here. If you believe in the official co-data value, which is actually dominated by hydrogen spectroscopy, it should be here, but it turned up somewhere else. And so that's the source of what's now known as the proton size puzzle. The proton is now known to better than a per mil, but it's about 4% 4, 4 smaller than the official value. Uh, this made some headlines. In 2010, this measurement was called the, one of the 10 breakthroughs for 2010. Uh, in Scientific American, there was a comment, whatever the answer, physicists will most likely have plenty to keep scratching their heads about for years to come, and that's what we are doing right now. We're scratching our heads. The puzzle continues. A few weeks ago, there was a new paper in Science where additional data have been analyzed so that we now also have an experimental value for the hyperfine splitting in Munich hydrogen, but uh, so there's this second line from F equal zero to F equal one that was also recorded. And the result is that now the uncertainty has been reduced by another factor of two or so, but the proton size has not moved, so it's still in contradiction to the co-data value. From the hyperfine splitting, you can determine the so-called Seymach radius of the proton, and from that, the magnetic root mean square radius in agreement with existing measurements. Uh, if you believe in this muonic proton radius, then you can improve the Rydberg constant, and uh, it's also now considerably better, but in contradiction with the established co-data value and, and the new uh, proton size uh, makes an even smaller error. So if you believe in this, this would be the new uncertainty of the Rydberg constants, almost an order of magnitude or so, improvement. And of course, people are wondering uh, what causes this discrepancy and who is right. Uh, the electron scattering data have been previously analyzed in a way that contributed to this official co-data value. There is a new analysis recently published uh, that uh, argues that one should uh, obey or should respect some analytic constraints to the form factor, some so-called dispersion analysis, and they actually move the electron scattering radio so that it's in agreement with the muonic radio. So, but if you can, just by choosing different ana analysis, move it over the map, I'm not very happy. Uh, so we, we have to wait. Maybe the new spectroscopy in hydrogen will contribute to the solution. Uh, there are also unpublished observed resonances in muonic deuterium that haven't been fully analyzed yet. There is the so-called Kramer collaboration that is setting up to measure the lamp shift in hydrogen-like muonic helium. Uh, here, the lamp shift is actually in the near visible region, so the laser are less challenging. And if there is any anomaly in the interaction of muons with nuclei, maybe this will shed light on it. So, I'm sorry to have to leave you with some open question. Maybe since I started with Charlie Towns, I will end with a quote from his book, How the Laser Happened, where he argues 
there is much that we don't understand, and in many cases we don't understand that we don't. And the really surprising discoveries will probably depend primarily on individuals, not teams or committees. Also, the individual may be part of a team. So this is very much in my spirit that we should perform more curiosity-driven research so that we have a chance, like this little chick, to find out that the fence is not closed in the back and we can reach the goal much more easily than the senior chicken that is goal-oriented. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. I should maybe, in the, in the end, just point out, uh, I did not have time, but this frequency comb that was essentially invented to find out if hydrogen describes the simple hydrogen atom, the quantum mechanics, uh, uh, well enough, uh, that this frequency comb has found a tree of, a growing tree of applications far away from our original intentions. Uh, Natalie Piquet in Garching is now using it to look at complex molecular spectra using the 100,000 comb lines in a highly multiplexed way. Astronomers are uh, equipping spectrographs with such combs uh, for precision astronomy, for searches for extrasolar planets or for uh, gathering evidence for the continuing expansion of the universe. And so it shows that this curiosity-driven research can have some spin-off applications here. Are our, the people from our hydrogen team, of course, I'm very grateful to all of them. And now I thank you for your attention. <laughs>